I'll be paying the price for that. Okay, we are recording. All right. And what we're going to cover here is we're going to finish off Unit 4 of Psychoacoustics. And last time we talked a little bit about those psychometric functions regarding spondee words and single-syllable speech words. And we were looking at speech audiometry, not from an audiometry point of view, but from a psychoacoustics point of view. We'll leave that alone now. Put that in the rear view mirror, and let's look at the top of page three where it says differential threshold. And I'm going to share the screen here, yeah, and uh, scrunch that down and pull up this word thing right here at the right where you see differential threshold here. That is something we do not use as HISs. We do not do this, but. Kelly was asking about hair cells. We were talking a little bit about anatomy before we started to record this session, and that's where this actually comes a little bit into play. Have a read with me. Differential threshold applies more to research in psychoacoustics, not really applied HIS field, but look at what it says here. It's Instead of absolute threshold, which is, did you hear it or did you not, which is what the HIS uses in clinical practice, differential threshold investigates what's the smallest difference between two values already heard, you already are hearing them, what's the smallest difference you can make before you can notice a difference? In other words, if I play a thousand hertz tone so you hear it, if I play a 1,001 hertz tone, could you hear a difference in the frequency? Or when I played the 1,000 hertz tone, did I need to make the next tone 1,010 hertz for you to hear a difference? How big of a change did I need to make for you to notice that there was a change? That's what's called differential threshold. Differential threshold can be applied to frequency, like I just gave that example. It can also be applied to intensity. If I play a, a tone at 70 dB SPL or 70 dB HL, why not just say 70 dB HL? If I play a tone at 70, if I play that tone at 71, were you able to tell that it was a little bit more? Or did I need to make it 73? for you to notice that it was a little bit more than 70? Or did I need to make it 75 for you to notice that there was a change? So differential threshold can be applied to frequency, intensity, and also to time. What's the biggest change in time? Here's an example. If I play a tone like this, da, da, did you notice that there was a gap between them? You'll go, yeah. OK, what about this? Da, da, What's the smallest gap? What's the smallest slice I can make for you to think, oh, no, that's just one steady tone. I can't hear that there's a splice in it. So you can play differential threshold all the way through each and every dimension of sound, frequency, intensity, and time. There's something that says below here, the Weber fraction. It's easy to distinguish between one and two pounds, but it's not very easy to distinguish between 100 and 101 pounds. A lot of times we call differential threshold JND, just noticeable difference. What was the just noticeable difference? So for a pound, what's the just, what's the just noticeable difference in terms of weight? Oh, well, it's about 0.1 pounds. Like if I have a pound and I add about 0.1 pounds to that, you'll think, yeah, I think I noticed that it was a little bit heavier. Just noticeable difference for 100 pounds is going to be about 10 pounds. If I put, if you're holding 100 pounds, if, you, if I put five more pounds on it, you're not going to recognize that there's a difference. I'll have to be putting about 10 pounds on for you to notice that there's a difference. Anyway, a third label for, so it's called differential threshold or just noticeable difference. It can also be called difference Lyman. Don't ask me why, it's a German word, same thing. And the, the symbol for differential threshold, 
Remember last time, I'll stop sharing here. Remember a, a couple of weeks ago, I held up my paper and I went, that's the symbol for threshold. Well, the symbol for differential threshold is a triangle, delta. Okay. Delta. Delta F means what's the just noticeable difference for frequency. Delta I, what's the different just noticeable difference for intensity. So, del so delta, delta I, delta F, delta T for time. So, there you go. We've worked our way down to the middle of page three. So, if you can just read what's, what's, oh yeah, look at this. Old audiometers, get this. There used to be a test, and you may notice this when you're in clinical practice, especially if you're looking at an old audiometer that's been in that office for some time, or maybe the guy got it off of eBay for cheap. It's an audiometer that's from the 1980s or 1970s, kind of a, you know, some, you may notice a button on it called Sissy, S-I-S-I. -S -I. And what that means is short increment, short, short intensity, something short intensity, something increment. Anyway, that's a test of difference Lyman for de delta F or for intensity. People thought that if you had cochlear pathology, now, did you learn about recruitment? Have you learned, has, has Dr. Cluck talked about the term called recruitment yet? Not that I recall. Okay. I will just talk to you about that. Recruitment means with hearing loss, 100, 100 dB hertz, just as much as 100 dB hertz for someone with normal hearing. If I turn up a sound up to about 100 decibels, you're going to be going, ah. If you have sensory neural hearing loss, and I turn it to 100 dB, you're going to be going, ah, same thing. The ceiling of loudness tolerance, and you can see my ceiling here in this room. The ceiling of loudness tolerance remains the same for normal hearing versus sensory neural hearing loss. That's called recruitment. Well, in other works. words, the floor of their hearing sensitivity has, has risen, but their loudness tolerance or uncomfortable loudness level hasn't changed. In fact, sometimes it's even reduced. The word is called recruitment, okay? So, back to sharing screen here. I think that's the sissy test that has a short interval sensitivity index or some stupid thing like that and what it meant. Oh, here it is, short increment sensitivity index. Right there, it's written right there on the page. That was a test for recruitment. If you had sensory neural hearing loss, if I made a little bit of a change to in intensity, you'd go, oh, yeah, I really noticed a change. So and I'm just like, whereas if you had sensory neural hearing loss and I made that little change in intensity and you didn't notice a change, you'd think, ooh, that could be an eighth nerve tumor. It was an old test used to differentiate between cochlear pathology versus eighth nerve pathology. And it came out in the days before x-rays and in the days before CAT scans and in the days before MRIs. Nobody uses it anymore. But it's based on delta I. What's the smallest change I needed to make in the intensity for you to notice that there's a change? And the philosophy was sensory neural hearing loss had an abnormally small delta F. They were really sensitive to changes in intensity. All right? There you go. Enough on that. All right. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. Look at this here. Frequency discrimination, right here. Frequency discrimination or frequency resolution. Let's talk about what those terms mean. They deal with delta F or JND, just noticeable difference, or difference Lyman for F, what's grayed out right here. Okay, so frequency discrimination or frequency resolution. Now, in English, that means what's the smallest, how good is your ability to distinguish between frequencies close together? 
In other words, with my fingers really close together, were you able to distinguish between frequencies really close together, or did they have to be way further apart for you to notice that there was a change? How good was the clarity on your television? How was your focus? How was your resolution? Could you see the characters really clearly, or were things kind of blurry? If I stop sharing here and we read about what it says here, ability of the auditory system to resolve or distinguish, let me highlight that, between the individual components of a complex sound. Hmm. Worse this with sensory neural hearing loss. Worse with damage to outer hair cells. Okay. Ah, let's see if we got a picture here. Ah, let's pull up this here and see if we've got something here. Ah, look at the bottom picture. Great. Here we go. Pull that guy up. Okay. Now, you may have learned this in your anatomy class. This is one of the second last slides in your PowerPoint. You likely have it yourself, but have a peek at the screen here. This is showing you a traveling wave in a cochlea, okay? A low pitch tone. Not, let me highlight this for you. This is the basilar membrane. Can you see that horizontal line? That's the floor upon which all your hair cells are standing. On the right, this would be the base of the cochlea. Think of this as by the oval window. And over here, this is the apex of the cochlea. All we did was we unrolled the cochlea. So this whole line is about one inch long. We've unrolled the cochlea. And now the blue wave is showing you a traveling wave. Have you learned that yet in anatomy, a traveling wave? Okay likely have okay so the hair cells are stimulated by traveling waves so every sound that 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 activates the cochlea you get a different blue wave if it's a high pitch your blue wave will happen right here high frequency hair cell stimulation low frequencies it'll happen here mids it'll happen in the middle so think about it every word every syllable i'm saying you've got thousands and thousands of these waves happening all we're doing is we're pulling out one wave and we're looking at it. It's a blue wave and it's stimulating these hair cells. You see that? Okay. Outer hair cells sharpen the peak. Right here, this little black triangle. Outer hair cells, they do two things. They amplify the peak. You can see that it's taller and they sharpen it. So now think about the absence of the outer hair cell action. Look at here. All these hair cells are stimulated. You see that? With one low frequency tone, a whole bunch of hair cells are stimulated. Whereas, and that's what happens with hearing loss. That's what happens with sensory neural hearing loss. The person no longer has the outer hair cells acting anymore. They've died. The outer hair cells are the moving parts of, of a system. The outer hair cells are always stretching and shrinking. They sharpen. They, they literally do this to the wave, that they're pushing it up into a point. That's how outer hair cells improve delta F. They improve the ability to distinguish between frequencies that are right next to each other. Outer hair cells are the first to die. They're the moving part. They're the gas hogs. If they were automobiles, they'd be hummers. They suck up more gas than you can wave a stick at. So with anything that goes wrong with the ear, it's usually outer hair cells that <clears throat> die. Noise, induced hearing loss, kills outer hair cells. Age, kills outer hair cells. Oto, uh, medicines that are ototoxic, kill outer hair cells. They are the most sensitive little queen what do you call it? Little uh, spoiled little brats. Okay. So they die first. And what the outer hair cells do is they help the inner hair cells pick up soft sounds. Soft, how soft? Below 50. Look at my hand here, below 50. So guess what? With outer hair cell damage, you've got a mild to moderate sensory neural loss. Welcome to presbycusis. Has she taught you that term? Okay, Presbyterian Church of the Elders. 
Presbyopia, your arms aren't long enough to read the page. Presbycusis, hearing loss in the elders. Presby Presbyterian means church of the elders as opposed to the, to the bishops. So look at the slide here. Without outer hair cells, you have a dull, rounded, traveling wave. And all of your peaks are dull and rounded. So that you cannot, read cannot, distinguish between frequencies close together anymore. That's why people hate hearing aids, because their delta F has gone down. They can't separate speech from background noise as well. They need a deliberately increased signal to noise ratio to separate speech from background noise. And much as you and I were discussing before we recorded, they don't need much. They need about five dB. Like we said about the teacher in the classroom, if you can make his or her voice five decibels louder than the noise, boom, Bob's your uncle. Same with mild to moderate sensory neural loss, outer hair cell pathology. 95% of, uh, of sensory neural loss is outer hair cell pathology. What do they get? Dull, rounded, traveling waves, no longer sharpened. So they, their, their comb has fewer teeth. It hasn't got 100 teeth anymore. It's got 10. So they need bigger changes in frequency for them to notice that there's a change. They have lost their resolution along the way. And that's gone down. We can't regain what went down with the flood. That's finished. So all you can do is provide amplification with a hearing aid, duh, but also improve the signal-to-noise ratio. How? With loop systems, with directional microphones, with FM systems, with any one of these assistive listening devices. That's why they enter the picture of hearing aids. It's all about, spoken from a psychoacoustics point of view, delta F. So it's what we're trying to do here is kind of weave the proverbial rug because you can't teach acoustics only by itself. Now it becomes inextricably connected to anatomy that you're learning. And the anatomy becomes connected to the, to the necessities of hearing aids, of directional mics and all of this stuff. And that thing we talked about earlier, recruitment, that's tied to something in hearing aids too. It's called compression. Compression means hearing aids have to amplify soft sounds by a lot, but loud sounds by little or nothing at all. So if a 95 dB sound comes in, the hearing aid says, hey, I'm not touching that. But if the sound's 5 dB, amplify the shit out of it. So it's a, it's, hearing aids are constantly changing the amount by which they're amplifying. That's why they cost so much. See? Hook! all stuff together and you walk out with a two-year diploma in something you know that's really it's a fascinating field it's a so this is the situation with uh, sensory neural loss and this is actually a slide borrowed from anatomy you might even see it later on from uh, dr cluck's class you never know i gave it to her who knows and i said go for it if you want it so okay we now have covered some of that and we'll let we will read on our little thing here. Okay, worse with sensory neural loss and damage to outer hair cells. Place theory of pitch perception. More on this in next unit. Don't worry about it. In English, it just means specific plate frequencies are represented in specific places in the cochlea. The cochlea is tonal topic, just like keys on a piano. With hearing loss and outer hair cell damage, the keys just got bigger. No longer are they little fingers anymore. Now they're fatter. They just are not quite as the frequency resolution has gone down. Traveling wave, as we just described, stimulates particular hair cells in particular cochlear region. Traveling wave in the cochlea is asymmetrical, steep front toward the front. Look at this. The wave, look at the, it's shaped like a kite. Isn't that weird? This has implications too. And I'm going to just describe these in the last three minutes of this half an hour before we jump over to binaural hearing. Okay? The shape of this wave, like a little, like a kite. Now, think of this wave as made by a rumbling of a truck. 
blah, 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 blah. And in the kitchen, you have a canary in a little cage. And the canary's going, beep, 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 beep. The canary's peeps will be here. And the rumbling of the truck will be blah, 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 blah. Look at how the tail of the wave will involve the, the canary's peeps. Beep, 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 beep. The tail of the wave will mask. Mask. The same mask. <laughs> okay. Whereas, let's say if Miss Canary gets hairy and she's beep, 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 beep. She can peep all she wants. Her wave is going to stay here while the rumbling of a truck, even if it's a soft rumble, like blah, 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 blah. Her peeping, she can peep all she wants, but it's not going to mask here. Her wave is going to stay here. Do you see that? That's called the upward spread of masking. Low pitches mask highs. Better than highs mask lows. Upward spread of masking. Background noise is mostly low frequency. Consonants of speech are mostly high frequency. Background noise, therefore, is a very effective masker of high frequency consonants. That's another reason why people hate hearing aids. So out of this picture, you now have two reasons why hearing aids and people mix like oil and water. One reason is because the sharpening is gone. And the second reason is the asymmetrical kite shape of this traveling wave. Okay? Low frequencies will mask highs. Better than highs will mask lows. Miss Harry Canary's traveling waves are staying right where my cursor is. They're not getting out here to where the truck action is. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Just to say, we will encounter this again in psychoacoustics. So, all right. Now you've got a lot of words in here, the bottom part here, and it's called temporal theory. And I think you'll see up here place theory. Okay, temporal theory, place theory. Those are just two theories as to how the cochlea is tono topic or how specific frequencies are represented in specific places. That's all that they are. Helmholtz is the one you and I've talked about. High frequencies are located near the base of the cochlea. Low frequencies are located near the apex, just like keys on a piano. That's what we've been studying so far. There's another guy called Rutherford, and he held the temporal theory. The temporal theory says, ah, that's not the only way that's, that, that the cochlea is tonotopic. Here's another way. The eighth nerve will fire 500 times a second with a 500 hertz tone. It'll fire 100 times a second with a 100 hertz tone. It'll fire 200 times a second with a 200 hertz tone. But guess what? You can't, a nerve can't fire more than 500 times a second. So how do you tell 1,000 hertz? How do you tell 2,000 hertz? Oh, then that's where the volley theory comes in. You'll have one fire firing twice and another one firing 500 times. Two times 500 is 1,000. Oh, <laughs> right. oh yeah, that's, that's kind of what, yeah, thank you for laughing because that's, it's a, but it's called the temporal theory of how we perceive pitch okay helmholtz is the yeah. one is the place theory of how we perceive pitch Tem rutherford had the temporal theory of how we perceive pitch now next week in psychoacoustics i'm going to introduce you to two things that are not explained well by helmholtz's theory mm -hmm. and that you'll have to kind of kind of go oh i'll give you a hint as to one of them right now Listen to the rev of a motorbike. How come when you increase the revs, the pitch goes up? Each is a, is, a, is a piece of transient noise from the motorbike. How come when you rev a motorbike, your pitch goes up? Every blast of white noise is identical. 
But when you made more of them per second, your pitch perception went up. That is not explained by Helmholtz's place theory. So just <laughs> food for thought. Just anyway, let's move on and talk about binaural hearing. Spend our last 30 minutes on binaural hearing. Why do we got two ears? All right. Two's better than one, right? <laughs> yeah, two ears are better than one. Why do we have two eyes? <laughs> this is kind of wild. You know why we have two eyes? You have two eyes to see depth. Oh, okay. okay. A gotcha. one-eyed person. Yeah, you lose your depth perception. The same if you had one ear, you would lose your de direction perception. Correct. Right? It's mainly about directionality. Yeah. And, and, and directionality of hearing is better than, oh, this ear hears from over there, and this ear hears from over there. Uh -uh, it's better than that. If my head was like this, and you're talking to me, the sound of your voice is going to hit this ear a split second before it hits this ear. That's going to tell a little message in my brainstem to snap my head this way. That you're talking to me. It's really wild. So let's read about the good old binaural hearing, because there's a, a few things about it. Directionality is the main one, but well, there's another one too. Oh, yeah. Superior olivary complexes. Yeah, they look like olives. That's why they were called olivary. Okay. It's these two little nuggets inside your brain stem. Your brain stem, I'm not sure if Dr. Cluck has described this. Your brain stem is simply your spinal cord inside your skull. Okay. Your spinal cord is part of your brain. It goes all the way down to your rear end. So your brain has a tail about three feet long. Anyway, the part of the spinal cord that goes in your skull is called the brain stem. And in the brain stem, that's where your eighth nerves come from each ear and they meet the brain stem. And that brain stem is one inch long, it's really short. The eighth nerves are one inch long each. The eighth nerves, how many cranial nerves do you have? 12, 12 pairs. The eighth pair is your hearing and balance one. It's the shortest of all your cranial nerves, one inch long. So it's kind of horizontal and your brain stem is vertical. Horizontal, vertical. When audiologists do brain waves, and Dr. Cluck will probably teach you about this, it's called auditory brain stem response. They use brain waves to test infants to test babies. They'll put a head, electrodes on the ears, a ground on the forehead, headphones on the ears, and they'll have sounds going da, 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 and they're measuring the brain waves. And the brain waves come from your eighth nerves and your brain stem. Okay, and that's how they test infants or liars. <laughs> People who won't tell you what they hear. I've done it. It's <laughs> anyway, so we're looking at I don't know how I got off on, oh yes, yeah. Superior olivary complexes are little areas inside your brain stem. Little tiny, and they look like olives, but they don't have pimentos, okay? These compare sounds from both ears. That's where your directionality comes from. All right, so they are the first nucleus. They're, they're little gray areas, a pair of little gray areas, one's on the right, one's on the left, and they receive information. Each one, the right one and the left one, each receives info from both ears. This plays a big part in binaural hearing, this little nucleus. Your acoustic reflex, have you learned about that in anatomy class yet? That's what we're, we're on that right now. Good. That's one of our words this week. All right. Acoustic. All right. Yeah. Put a loud sound in both ears, and you'll get an acoustic reflex happening in both ears. Okay? Your acoustic reflex arc, the mess, your acoustic reflexes is the outer ear, the middle ear, cochlea, eighth nerve, superior olivary complex, and then back out the fifth nerve and back out the seventh nerve and the fifth nerve terminates on the tensor tympani muscle and the seventh nerve t terminates on the stapedius muscle and those two little muscles contracting are in your middle ear and that's called the acoustic reflex so you have a brain going part 
and it goes all the way to the superior olivary complexes and then back out the fifth nerve and the seventh facial nerve to the tensor tympani muscle and stapedius muscles respectively. Okay, that's the acoustic reflex arc. It involves the superior olivary complex too. So there's a lot of directionality involves it. All right, here's some binaural terms. Azimuth just means straight on, above. It just means that your, your horizontal plane. Don't worry about it. Interaural. Inter is always between. Interaural. The word intra, I-N-T-R-A, means within. The difference inter means between ears. Intraoral means within one ear. Interaural, intraoral. Monotic means one ear. Diotic means same sounds to both ears. So when I'm talking, you're hearing me diotically. You're hearing my voice in both ears. Dichotic is really weird. Dichotic is different sounds to each ear at the same time. Different. Now, I can give you an example of dichotic listening. And you've experienced it. No, no doubt you've experienced it. You're talking on the phone. You're trying to take directions. Okay, now you're going to get to the gas station, and you got to turn right at the red light. And your husband's going, no, um, make sure that she tells you blah, blah, blah. And you're going, shut up. I'm trying to hear them. You're, you're getting two sounds at once. You're, you're getting sound. You're trying to hear in this ear, and you're getting competing crap in this ear. You're like getting dichotic listening. And it's very aggravating. It's like, oh, it's unnatural. It's not the way we hear. Women are better at that than men. They are. <laughs> because we can go to dinner and I can hear the conversation at the table behind us and say, oh, did you know that? He's like, what? I know. You know, <laughs> I don't know. I can't help it. I just hear what they're saying. Back there then. is actually the statistical data to back your observation up. Women are better at dichotic listening. It's a test that audiologists do for learning disabilities. Oh. And it's usually the little boys that fail the test, not the girls. <laughs> yeah. They'll put dichotic digits in the ears, like a one, one, six, four, nine, ramp, ramp, and they'll ask the kid to repeat these things. And usually the boys can't do it very well. Whereas the girls usually can. It's a, funny that you've mentioned that. I think that's hilarious. <laughs> anyway, dichotic listening. So monotic, diotic, dichotic. Here's another word you're going to see quite a bit in this field. Lateralization. Ability to localize sounds from the left or right ear. There are several advantages to binaural listening, meaning you have two ears are better than one. There's four basic ways, and we'll quickly review these. <laughs> Basically, binaural summation, that's number one. Two ears are about five dB better than one. Now, what does this mean for clinical reality? It means that if you're deaf in one ear, it doesn't mean you've got a 50% hearing loss, okay? So let's give an example here. Let's say it takes you 5 dB to hear in this ear, 5 dB to hear in this ear. Played together, your threshold will be zero, okay? Two ears are about 5 dB better than one. If it takes 40 to hear in this ear, 40 to hear in this ear, binaurally, my threshold would be 35. Got it? Binaural summation. Perfect. Next. <laughs> the next one is the big one. Directionality or localization of sound. For low frequencies below 1500 hertz, it's the tiny time difference between the ears. Sound goes, what, 1130 feet per second, 340 meters per second? My head is six inches wide. So if I have my head turned to the side and you're talking to me, sound's going to hit my left ear split second before my right ear. The tiny time difference is what I'm going to use to localize 
low frequency sound. Okay, because low frequencies are longer. Low frequencies have long sound waves. Remember we learned in acoustics that lows bend and highs bounce? Uh, right. Good. Well, if I'm turned sideways and you're talking to me, the low frequencies are going to have longer waves. They will bend around my head, okay? So your, my left ear in this case will hear the, your voice a split second before my right ear. That helps me localize sounds below 1500 hertz. Above 1500 hertz, now the waves are really short. The waves are too short to bend around my head. So I can't use that cue anymore. I have to use a different cue. And that different cue is this. Highs, if I'm ta talking, you're talking to me again, high frequencies are going to be a little bit louder to the, your voice is going to be a little bit louder to this ear than it will to this ear because I got 10 pounds of ugly fat separating my ears, okay? So if I'm this way and you're talking to me, your voice is going to be a slight bit louder to this left ear than it will to my right ear because of my head shadow. No, that's and, a lot of things, this big head shadow. There you go. And so the cue for localizing the direction of high frequency sounds is tiny intensity differences between the ears. Get it? So you, your, your body uses two different cues to localize sound. One is tiny time differences, and that helps you localize low frequency direction. Tiny intensity differences help you localize high frequencies, the direction of high frequencies. And the reason why is because sounds above 1500 hertz have sound waves that are too short to bend around my head. So I can't use the time cue anymore. I have to rely on a different cue. And that cue is tiny intensity differences. Cool? Great. Just great, as they say in Scotland. Oh, hi. All right. No more about that, although I could show you a picture of it here. Why not? Here's a guy's head. Let's see if I'll show you this picture here. Oh, yeah, here we go. Here's a guy's head. And here's sound coming from a certain direction. Now notice here, notice the sound coming to this guy's right ear. It's going to be a little bit earlier in time than it will to, this, to the left ear. So that's what's going to help you localize low frequencies. And the sound's also going to be a little bit more in intensity. It's going to be a little bit louder to this right ear than it will to that ear. And that's how the guy localizes low frequencies. So the sound reaches the right ear first, it says, and so there's an interaural difference in the arrival time. And the sound at the left ear is less intense than that at the right ear, leading to an interaural level difference or intensity difference. Okay? Now, yeah, that's the directionality. Oh, yeah, and the mid frequencies around 2,000 hertz, those are the hardest ones to localize because your, those little superior olivary complexes don't know which cue to use, intensity or time, intensity or time. They're mixed up. They don't know which one to use. So they, they call that sometimes the cone of confusion. The hardest frequencies to localize are the mid frequencies. This one over here, binaural beats, is just kind of an oddity. It's, it's like, eh, uh, I could read it to you, and I look at it sometimes, and I think to myself, ah, you can read it if you want, but I don't feel like wasting our time on it. It's, it's not really, it's just psychoacoustics, but I'm not going to uh, question anybody on it at all. This one here we need to look at. This is how we finish things. Masking level difference, next section on masking. We'll cover that a little bit more later, but here's something. I'll just draw a picture here. We'll look at a picture. Here's one picture. Oh, yeah, here, let's see. And here's another picture. Ah, okay, good stuff. Okay, let's look first at this guy's picture. Right ear, left ear, signal, a tone you're trying to hear, and noise. Okay, left ear, you're hearing a, the same signal, the same noise. The guy's unhappy because the same noise and the same pure tone to both ears the tone detection is hard. It's hard to, hard to do. Whereas this guy in the middle is happy 
because even though the noise is the same to both ears, looky, looky, there's something different about the signals. This one's got a different phase than this one. This pure tone is inverted. It's a little bit different. So this guy's happy because there's some binaural difference. Things are not exactly the same to both ears. And look at this guy at the bottom. He's happy as well. Because look at this. He's got the same noise in both ears, but the tone is only to one ear. Cool. He's happy too because there's a difference. There's something different. Either the noise is different or the signal is different. But by gum, something is different. And we are always listening to speech in noise. We're always trying to hear the signal in noise. So if the, if the signal and the noise are really even, Steven, in intensity, we're going to have a hard time picking out the signal. We've, so we've said that. So if there's something different about the speech signal, just a slight difference, or if the noise has changed a little bit between ears, ah, we're happy. Even though they stay the same intensity, we've made them a little bit different. This is why pilots flying their airplanes, especially those little Cessnas, noisy little Volkswagens with wings, okay? Little crop dusters, noisy buggers. So that pilot, if he's communicating or if she's talking to the, to the control tower and the cockpit noise is loud and the person's got headphones on, they're trying to hear the cockpit the, the, the message from, 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 the, from the control tower, it's really hard because they're getting the same speech and they're in the same cockpit noise. So guess what pilots often do? They'll take off one headphone. They'll put it here. And they'll, now I'm getting the speech from the control tower in one ear. I've made something different between the ears. It's easier to hear the control tower now. That's the example that's given in that last slide here okay now people always draw things I try to draw things too and you know here's this weird oh yeah good I unstuck it great this here's a here's another example of sound coming from a from a side of a person but that's not the one we want to look at here's how Teddy draws the two if the signal and the signal see how this one's in italics this is something different about the signal, and yet the noise is the same. He's happy. If the signal's identical, but something's different about the noise, he's happy. But noise here is not in italics. This one's in italics. I just did it that way. If there's a signal and noise here, and no, just the noise here, but no signal, that's the pilot I was talking to you about. He's happy. If the signal is identical, and the noise is identical, he's bummed out. He can't hear the signal as well. And last but not least, the one-eared person. Okay, this guy's deaf in one ear. He's only got the signal and the noise to his good ear. So that's another disadvantage. And we'll call that disadvantage number three. What happens with the loss of hearing in one ear? This is about unilateral hearing loss. First of all, no more binaural summation. Two ears are about 5 dB better than one. Second of all, can't tell the direction. Can't tell the direction for love nor money. You know what? I used to do this to my students at Conestoga College in Kitchener, Ontario, when I taught them anatomy and I taught them acoustics. I'd take us one student and I'd say, here you go, I'm going to blindfold you. And I'd put a blindfold on him. And then I'd take an EAR plug, one of those spongy little yellow earplugs, and I'd plug his ear, plug his ear with it. And then I would walk around in the room and I would carry like two pens or something. I would just, or I would just make noise. Like, and I would ask the person to point in which direction he heard it. So he was blindfolded, and I put an earplug in one ear, and I'd walk around to one corner of the room, and I'd go, T -t 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 -t. and he'd point at some totally different direction. He had no idea. Then I'd have him take out the plug and do it again, bang on, bang on, bang on, even though he's blindfolded. 
That's what you two years localized sound. So binaural summation, localization, and last of all, we called it the cocktail effect. And that's what this number four is here. That's what this picture is showing you, the cocktail effect. Hearing speech in background noise. Think of at a party. If, there, if you've got two ears, it's likely that there's going to be something different in the signal to both ears or something different in the noise, and you're going to have a better ability to hear in noise than the person with one ear because the person with one ear can't compare signal to both ears and can't compare noise to both ears. Okay, that's it, Skipitsky, for Unit 4, Psychoacoustics. That's, we are now done that. So are we having a quiz on this? I think so. Here, let me look. I didn't see it on the computer yet. I guess maybe. Later. I don't think so. I don't think you have a quiz on this. Oh, okay. Nope. I'll take a peek, so I'll take a look, see. I, I, I mean, we I'm have the whole... one on the first part of it, the, the one. Hang on here. I can tell you right well. I'll just go on my computer here, and I'll, oh, just, okay. I'll just take a look, and then I'll, I'll be able to tell you right there. Let's see. Let's go into documents, and then OTC. I like to call OTC over-the-counter, over-the-counter hearing aids. <laughs> Here we go, and quizzes and tests, and quiz three, psychoacoustics. Let me see if I've got that guy here. Sure for bias. You guys have already done this one. We already did that one. Yep. Yeah. Okay, I'll, cl I'll close it. I'll look at quiz four. Wait, 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 wait. maybe that wasn't the same one. Hold oh, on. let me see, okay. Let me, let me go back. I, I, I copy my tests so I can use them, for, you know, I keep a copy All right, hang. binder so I can yep. have them for referral. Oops. Yep. Okay, the, the very first one on quiz three was the uh, short form sign for uh, Greek letter. That's right. So that yep. was that one, yeah. So. And then the bottom had that square. Square, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so that's, that one. you've All done right. that one. Uh -huh. So now let me look at quiz four. And that's this one here. Yep, there is a quiz on this. Yep. Okay, so there yep. is. So and now look at that. You'll even see psychometric function on the bottom. Okay, okay. Okay? Okay. All right, if it's not uploaded, I'll contact uh, Lynn Royer and make sure that she does. Yeah, I didn't see it the uh, last I checked. Cause it I... should be uploaded soon. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, that concludes our little, um, what do you call it? Zoom session today on Psychoacoustics Unit okay. 4. So the next one is Unit 5. five. Okay. And it's going to be on loudness and pitch. Loudness, loudness and pitch. Okay. We'll be talking more about minimal audible pressure and minimal audible field there. Okay. Okay. All right. It's been okay. a slice. Thanks okay. for joining. Thanks, Dr. Vanilla. Have a good day. Uh, you too. All right. See you next time.